Well, thank you very much. Welcome to all of you for tonight's talk, The Life of the Buddha According to the Pali Text by Venerable Shravasti Damika, who will be speaking to us from Queensland in Australia. And he's about two hours ahead of us, so it is actually 10 p.m. there. So we are very grateful to Venerable uh, Damika for staying up late for us in order to give us uh, this Dhamma talk. And I would like to encourage you to click like and comment in order for us to be a little bit more interactive. And of course, we can take questions and please ask questions that is uh, relevant and direct uh, from the talk. Um, for us to be able to spot the questions from your comments, what you need to do if you're on Facebook is to type capital Q before typing your questions. So it is easy for us to uh, pick up, uh, you know, pick up your questions. Now, we have all been charmed by the biography of the Buddha with the various legends and imageries. Although there have been attempts by various Western scholars in modern times to write a full and detailed biography of the Buddha, there are a lot of traditional materials written in India. For instance, you have the Mahavastu, which is essentially a biography of the Buddha, but contains other materials such as the Jatakas, and the Avadanas, and there is a beautiful epic poem in Sanskrit written by Ashvagosha. He has written the Buddha Charita, which means the Acts of the Buddha. And this was written in the first century Common Era. That's about uh, 500 years after the Buddha. And there was also the Lalita Vistara. It is a biography of the Buddha that was written on the third century Common Era. And the uh, Abhinis Kramana Sutta which is an extensive biography of the Buddha and the trans Chinese translations dated um, between the third to the sixth century common era. The Lalita Vistara is a highly uh, poetic work with great devotional appeal and literary value. In fact, Sir Adrian Arnold wrote his famous poem, The Light of Asia, uh, and the, uh, was based actually on this work. And clearly some aspects of the Buddha can be categorized as historical facts, they're, they're, but there are many uh, myths and legends as well, and they have been introduced in order to add miracle, a sense of wonder and symbolism into the life of the Buddha. Now, since the Buddha's life has been clearly mentioned in the Pali texts, which comprise some of the earliest Buddhist materials that we have, it is certainly useful for us to take stock of what aspects are contained within the Pali, Pali text itself and what have been included by authors in the later centuries. Even as we are charmed by the beautiful stories and the imageries that surrounds the Buddha's life, it is certainly useful to return to what has been recorded in the Buddha Pali text, which serves us as a point of reference. In addition, we need to understand the political, the economic, social, and cultural environment during the Buddha's life in order to give us a context, a contextual setting, in order to understand his life better. Now, to do this, we have no other than our speaker this evening, who has written a book, Footprints in the Dust, The Life of the Buddha from the Most Ancient Sources. And this uh, book is still awaiting publication. And the latest that I've heard that it might, there might be a possibility that the Cambridge University Press could be printing this book, but uh, Venerable Damika says he doesn't have high hopes for that. But uh, I have gone through this book. It is an excellent book. And uh, I'm looking forward for the printed copy of this book. Now, our speaker this evening is Venerable Shravasti Damika, who was born in Australia and was ordained as a Buddhist monk in India. He later lived in Sri Lanka, where he became well known for his efforts to promote Buddhism. And for some years, he lived in Singapore as a spiritual uh, advisor of the Buddha, Buddha Dharma Mandala Society, as well as other Buddhist groups. He now lives in Queensland, in Australia, surrounded by his books, as you could see in the picture. <laughs> Venerable Dhammika has written many beautiful books on Buddhism. In fact, he was one of the uh, one of the very good, the best writers of Buddhism, because he writes in a manner that actually uh, it is easy for lay people to understand without, without beginning becoming too complicated with too many technical terms. And in fact, he has written the books on Buddhism and related topics. 
including the guide books of the holy places in India and Sri Lanka, which are excellent books for the pilgrim and which I have also uh, made reference, references to when I led uh, uh, pilgrimage to Sri Lanka and in India. He has also written a book uh, on Jesus and the Buddha, giving the Buddhist perspective of Jesus. But maybe his most popular book, and I use the word popular, it is good question, good answers. I'm sure many of you have seen this book. It has gone to many reprints and translated into many languages. So with that as an introduction, uh, we'd like to welcome uh, Venerable uh, Damika for you to uh, give us a talk this evening. Thank you, Bhante. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Victor Wee, uh, for that very nice um, uh, introduction. And um, those who are listening, uh, when, when Victor says how wonderful I am, I actually have to pay him to say that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ante is joking, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Vesak uh, um, is coming up, and um, so this is a pr an appropriate subject for the talk that I'm going to give tonight, and uh, also because for the last uh, four years I've been working on this book. Um, uh, on, on the other hand, in a sense, I've been writing the book for the last 30 years. Uh, since I became a Buddhist in my uh, late teens, I've always been fascinated by the the personage of the Buddha, and uh, it's his teachings that have um, pretty much guided in my life ever since I uh, became a Buddhist when I was about 19. Um, and so um, uh, four years ago, I decided to put together all of the things that I had learned, the things that I'd read from the Tupitaka, but also from uh, the writings of others, and write a book about the life of the Buddha, um, perhaps looking at his life from a completely different point of view than has usually been done. And um, if you look at any life of the Buddha, either a book or a, an article in, a in a, an encyclopedia, they're all pretty much the same. They are a what you call a, a narrative biography, starting with his birth, then his childhood, and then his youth, and then his early adulthood, and then his, um, his enlightenment, and uh, his career throughout his life, and, and his death. Uh, uh, a from birth to death narrative. Um, in fact, I've never read a book on the life of the Buddha, and I have read many, many of them, that doesn't present this approach. Um, but of course, for many years, I have been aware that there is no such life to death biography of the Buddha in the Pali Tripitaka. So if you look at the... Um, um, uh, the, the Gospels of, of Jesus, for example, uh, most of them start with his birth and then his, they skip over his youth and then his career, which lasted for three years, and, he, and his death and his resurrection. So it's a, it's a journey through time. Uh, however, if you want to write a life of the Buddha, you simply can't do that, not from the Pali to Pitika anyway, because there is no um, we don't know when any of these events that are most of the events that are mentioned in the uh, Tupitaka are when they took place. Okay, so I decided to take a completely different uh, approach. But before doing that, I, I had to look at how do we know about the Buddha? I mean, you know, where does our information about him come from? And um, it actually comes from three sources. The, the major source, or a major source, is the Pali Tupitaka. Now, the Pali Tupitaka um, is the oldest, or it contains the oldest information we know about the Buddha. Okay? Um, so there are lives of the Buddha written in Sanskrit, as um, uh, Victor said, um, the first one being the Lalita Vistara, and later on there was Ashvagota's Buddha, uh, Buddha Charita and works like this. But these were written many hundreds of years after the Buddha. Um, so 
the Pali Tipitaka as we have it today is it contains the earliest information we have about the Buddha as a person, about his life, and of course, particularly about uh, what he taught. Now, that's not to say that everything in the Pali Tipitaka is the same age. There are three or four books in the Kudaka Nikaya, which are really quite late. They, some of them may actually have been uh, written in, in Sri Lanka. But it's fairly easy uh, to, based on the contents and the language used, to see which parts of the Tipitaka are earlier and which parts are later. So that's the first source. The second source is, is the legends. Um, so, um, once again, as Victor said, the, the, probably the most important collection of legends about the Buddha uh, and the earliest one after the Tipitaka is what's called the uh, Mahavastu, which is an absolutely fascinating book. In actual fact, it's more like a library. It contains all sorts of information, some very early, some of a middle period, some later, um, all sorts of, it's a great big mess, but it's a fascinating mess. Um, and many of the things that we think we know about the Buddha came from the, uh, from the Mahavastu. And then there are later, later works written in Sanskrit up to about the fourth and fifth century. Okay. And then you have the much later Mahayana Sutras where they are teaching things that have their origins in the earliest teachings, but are certainly um, developments of those, including sup supposed incidents and things that the Buddha did. Mm -hmm. And then finally we have, and this may surprise you, we have legends that were developed in the last 100, 200 years. I'll give you just uh, one example of this. Um, uh, some of you may know there's a wonderful story about the Buddha where once he was going along the road to uh, Rajagir, Rajagaha, and he came across a shepherd leading a flock of sheep along the road. And at the, uh, as he approached this flock of sheep, there was one lamb at the very back of the, of the flock because it was limping. There was something wrong with its leg. It had an injured leg. So as he approached the flock, he picked up this lamb and carried it until he got to the shepherd. And he asked the shepherd, where are you taking these uh, sheep? And he said, I'm taking them to Rajagaha because King Bimbisara is having a great... Uh, a great sacrifice. The animals are going to be sacrificed to the, the gods. So the story continues that the Buddha followed the, uh, the um, flock of sheep and then he, he talked uh, King Bimbisara out of slaughtering all of these animals. And that's the story. It's a lovely story. And sometimes you see pictures of it in books. Um, I've seen it uh, once painted on the walls of a temple in, in Sri Lanka. Um, and it's a lovely story, but nobody knows where it comes from. It certainly doesn't come from the Tipitaka. It isn't in the Tipitaka. Uh, there's no record of it in any Sanskrit literature or, in fact, any Buddhist literature at all. It actually comes from um, uh, Edwin Arnold's uh, book, The Light of Asia, written in the 1860s, the 1870s. Now, uh, it's quite okay for a poet to invent a story about the Buddha. What I find surprising is many Buddhists, including many monks, think that it's an authentic story about the Buddha. Okay, And nowadays, if you turn on the, um, in the uh, look at some videos on YouTube and what have you about the Buddha, once again, you'll find some fascinating stories, most of them really quite positive, but none of them are from Buddhist literature, either early Buddhist literature or later Buddhist literature. In other words, my point is that legends about the Buddha are still being uh, created, okay? So we have these three sources. The uh, sources from the Pali Tipitaka, which are the earliest and most authentic. Then we have later, uh, mainly Sanskrit literature, and we even have a few legends uh, being created nowadays. I decided uh, to use in my book only the information from the Tipitaka. And straight away, that presented me with a problem. As I just said, there is no uh, birth to death uh, story, narrative story about the life of the Buddha in the Tipitaka. So what are you going to do? 
Um, so what I decided to do is simply go through the Tipitaka, pick out every single reference to something that the Buddha did or what he said or what happened to him and put it all in uh, order um, uh, so that it is not a birth to death um, uh, biography, but rather a biography of a person. Okay, so in a sense, this created another problem for me. Most of the things that we think we know about the Buddha are not to be found in the Tipitaka itself. So, for example, there are many stories very widely circulating about the Buddha's birth. One of them, for example, is that the, uh, the Buddha's mother gave birth uh, when she was a virgin. Uh, another one is that she had a dream of a white elephant. Lovely stories, but not to be found in the, uh, in the Tipitaka. And then everybody knows, even school children who are not Buddhists, know that the Buddha was a prince and his father was a king. Um, and there is no evidence for that either. Certainly, it seems that his father was from a ruling class family. And he, may, he was certainly probably was a chief an elected chief of the Sakyans, at least for some period, but he wasn't a king in the sense that we think about kings nowadays, or we think about what kings were for hundreds of years, okay? Uh, likewise, Kapalavastu is supposed to have been a great city, a great capital city. Now, there are two contenders for archaeological contenders for Kapalavastu today. One is a place called Piparoa, which is in, uh, in India, just near, just a few kilometers from the Indian border. And the other one is just a few kilometers across the Indian border in Nepal, and that's called uh, Tilorakot. Whichever one is the real one, both of them are very modest places. They are certainly not great cities. They're nothing like New York, nothing like London. They are little more than large villages. Okay, so there is no evidence that uh, uh, the Buddha's father was a king, that he was a prince, and that he lived in a great, uh, great metropolitan city. Okay. Um, one thing that I find uh, rather interesting, too, is that we have virtually no information about the Buddha's uh, childhood, about his youth, or about his early adulthood. In fact, we only have two or three very brief uh, pieces of information. One of them is the story about um, the sage um, Asita. So the story goes that Asita heard from the Devas that a wonderful boy had been born to the chief of the Sakyans. And so he went to a couple of us too, and he was given the child to hold. And because he was an expert in marks, bodily marks, auspicious marks on the body, he predicted, well, everybody knows that he predicted this child would become either a great spiritual leader or a great uh, political leader, either a Buddha, an enlightened sage, or a Chakravatin a universal statesman, a universal monarch. Wonderful story, but only half of that story is in the Tupitaka. Okay, so according to the Tupitaka's account, he simply predicted that the child would become a great spiritual teacher. He never mentioned anything about becoming a great political leader. Mm -hmm. um, then when uh, the other, uh, the only other two pieces of information is we are told that uh, by the Buddha himself later in his life, he was reminiscing about his childhood. And he mentioned that uh, he had three palaces or three, we can't call them palaces because he wasn't a, a king, um, uh, bungalows or villas, perhaps certainly probably very nice houses because his father was quite wealthy and politically powerful. Um, and the other one was that he had um, uh, a staff of dancing girls and what have you, which is, would have been quite typical for a person of his class at that time. Other than that, we have no information whatsoever. We don't know whether he was married. We don't know what his, who his wife was. 
everybody will tell you that the Buddha's wife was called Yasodhara. That name is not to be found anywhere in the Tipitaka. Okay, so we have virtually no information whatsoever about the Buddha's childhood, his youth, and his early adulthood. Okay. Then, um, then probably the most iconic story in the Buddha's life is the, the four signs. So the story goes that his father, the great king Siddhodana, was because uh, Asita had predicted that his son would become either a great spiritual leader or a great political leader. Naturally enough, being a king, he wanted his son to become a great political leader. So he confined him to a beautiful palace so that he would know nothing about the ugly aspects of life. But one day he managed to sneak out of the palace in his chariot and he saw or he encountered an old person somebody who was very sick, a body being taken for cremation, and finally a wandering ascetic. And it was these four sights that made him decide that he would renounce the world and um, become a wandering ascetic in search of truth. Wonderful story. And it's a great pity that the story is not in the Tipitaka because it's such a beautiful, iconic, and meaningful story. But unfortunately, it's not to be found in, in the Tibetica. Then uh, we've got things like probably one of the most spectacular stories, which everybody believes happened to the Buddha, was the miracle of Sankasya. Um, in, uh, in Sri Lanka, there is a wonderful, now ruined temple built about a thousand years ago. And on one wall, high up on the wall, it has a huge painting depicting this, um, this event. If you go to Sanchi, uh, on one of the gateways of the great stupa at Sanchi, which dates from about the first century BC, uh, you get a depiction of this wonderful um, miracle that the Buddha is supposed to have um, have um, um, done. So the story is that um, at one time the Buddha decided to spend the rainy season, the Vasa, by going up to heaven and teaching his mother, the Abhidhamma, in heaven. Now, I'm not a great fan of the Abhidhamma. I find it rather dull. So I always joke that if his poor mother had to listen to the Abhidhamma for three months, it would have turned heaven into hell. Uh, whatever the case is, that after his uh, three or four months up in heaven, a golden ladder, or actually three ladders, one of gold, one of silver, and one of crystal, appeared in the sky, something like a huge... Uh, escalator perhaps and the buddha came down with indra the god indra on one side holding an umbrella above him and the god brahma on a, on the other side and he he came down to earth like that now that is a miracle <laughs> that's a bit more spectacular than walking on the water or turning water into wine that really is a miracle and this is but uh, one of the most popular miracles for thousands of years this uh, there have been poems written about it. There are paintings of it. Uh, it is recited and talked about and widely believed, but it's not to be found in the uh, in the Tipitaka. So here we have a problem. If you want to write a biography of the Buddha, you find that you have, if you want to write a birth to death narrative, you find that you simply don't have the information. So what are you going to do? So this is what I did. I went through the Tibetic and I picked out every piece of information uh, that uh, pointed to something about the person of the Buddha himself, his character, uh, his habits, his travels, um, how he debated with his opponents and Brahmins who came or other ascetics who came to uh, debate with him, uh, how he taught, um, the, the techniques that he used um, as, as a teacher to transmit his teaching, his relationships with his disciples, his attitude towards his, um, his, his opponents, those who... Uh, who uh, criticized him, 
Um, uh, what else? Um, all sorts of things. And I decided to get all of that information and put it all together and present uh, the life of the Buddha from that point of view. And this is what I did. It took me, uh, it took me four years. I only finished really about uh, a month ago, and I'm still fiddling with it a little bit. Okay, and these are some of the things that I discovered. The first thing I discovered is the seemingly uh, wide difference between the Buddha of uh, common perception and the Buddha as he is presented in the in the Tipitaka. So uh, the Buddha as he is widely believed to be is certainly not in the Theravadan tradition anyway, not in the Pali tradition. He's certainly not uh, considered to be like a divine being or a divine principle as he is in some later Mahayana traditions. He is very clearly uh, a human being. But you would have to say that he is a superhuman being. So, for example, if we read in the commentaries, um, in one place in the commentary, it mentions that the Buddha went from here to there. And uh, in Buddha Gosa, in his commentary, he writes, but of course, Buddhas don't walk from here to there. They, they float a few inches off the ground and they just sort of drift along. Um, uh, all sorts of stories like this. So the Buddha is depicted very much and certainly traditionally by most uh, Buddhists in traditional Buddhist countries of Asia, see the Buddha very much as a superhuman being. And he is not presented like that in the Tibetica. One of the most startling stories about him or st incidents about him that I found, and you can look it up in the uh, Anguttara Nikaya. When my book comes out, you can find the, uh, the reference there and you can look it up. In one place, the Buddha said, when, he's on a, when I'm on a journey and I have to answer the call of nature to urinate or defecate, I look up the road to see if anybody's coming. And then I look down the road to see if anybody's coming. And then if there's nobody on the road, then I have a poo or a pee. Now, I find that that absolutely fascinating. Not because I'm interested in people's bodily motions, but here, those who compiled the Tipitaka were not frightened to mention this, that the Buddha went to the toilet, he had a runny nose, sometimes he sneezed, just like you and me. What made the Buddha different was not superhuman uh, abilities. What made him different was not an extraordinary body. What made him different was his understanding. And that cannot be depicted in art. And therefore, I imagine in ancient times, people tried to express the grandeur of the Buddha, not by paying too much attention to his teachings, but by presenting him sort of as a superhuman being. Now, in the Pali Tipitaka itself, the Buddha is sometimes depicted as talking to the gods, devas. Um, for example, in the Mangala Sutta, a very popular sutta, it says that the Buddha was meditating all night, and then suddenly there was this effulgent light in the, in the forest around him, and a deva came down and asked him a question. So somebody could say, well, that sounds pretty superhuman to me. <laughs> no devas have ever come down and talked to me. But I think that we can look at it like this. We can say that it's quite possible, even when the Buddha was alive, that people believed that gods came down and talked to him. It's possible that within a very short time of his passing, that people said that gods came down and talked to the Buddha. And there could have been a very good reason for that. First of all, they lived in a world where almost everybody believed in spirits, evil spirits, earth gods, and all sorts of things like that. And generally, they considered them to be extremely powerful and sometimes quite, quite dangerous in the case of some spirits. And so they created stories which demoted the gods. Uh, 
The gods come, the Buddha doesn't go up to heaven to talk to the gods, nor does he get messages from gods. Rather, the gods come down and ask questions for the Buddha. So this was a way of, as it were, demoting the Buddha, uh, sorry, demoting uh, the gods while um, promoting the Buddha. And I think that these stories can be um, understood like that. Now, if we go to something like the uh, Acharya Bhuta Dhamma Sutta, this is the only discourse in the uh, Tibetika, it's in the Majjhima Nikaya, where it talks about the Buddha's birth. Um, and uh, it is clearly a somewhat later sutra, because it's full of miracles. Uh, not that the Buddha's mother was a uh, a virgin or anything like that, but there are certainly miraculous events that are supposed to have happened according to this sutta when, when the Buddha was born. But um, I looked at every one of these to see if they had some role in the uh, other religions of the time. And this is what I found. Um, those of you who know that sutra and um, uh, uh, will know that according to this sutra, the Buddha's mother gave birth while she was standing. Um, you will often see a depiction of the Buddha's mother standing up, generally holding the branch of a tree, with the Buddha coming out of uh, her right side, the baby Buddha coming out of her right side. It's an interesting story. Um, so I thought, that's very strange. Why should be she be holding the branch of a tree? And why should be she be uh, standing? Sounds like a very unusual way for a woman to give birth to a child. So I looked it up. Uh, the first thing is, in the sutta does not mention that she hanged onto a tree. But it does mention that she gave birth standing. Hmm. So I have a friend who happens to be a doctor in England. And I asked him if he could give me some uh, information about childbirth practices. <laughs> In the UK. prone condition, in a prone uh, position. But apparently, until about 200 years ago, uh, only about 150 years, this is for, in the West at least, only for about 150 years has this become normal. Prior to that, women usually gave birth either crouching, or they used to have a thing called a birthing chair, which was pretty much like a chair, but it had a big hole on it, and the woman would just sit there and pop, the baby would come out the bottom. Well, maybe not pop, but it would eventually come out the bottom. Um, I have been able to find any information about childbirth practices in ancient India, but it seems, at least in village life in India today, women usually give birth standing. So we, when we read this sutta, we think that it is exaggerating or it is telling a tall tale that the Buddha's mother was standing. In actual fact, it's probably very likely that she did give birth standing because it apparently was a common practice at that time. Then there's another story uh, in that same Acharya Bhuta Dhamma Sutta, which says that when the Buddha was born, a great effulgent light shot up into the universe. And so powerful was this light that it even uh, was brighter than the light of the sun and the moon. And as a result of that light, the beings that lived in the murky darkness between the world systems, the chakavallis, the, the uh, uh, what's the word we use? The galaxies. That's the chakavalli. Chakra, of course, means a wheel. So a world system, what we would call a, a galaxy, the beings that lived in the darkness between the galaxies, because of that light, they could see each other for the first time. And they were able thus to communicate with each other. 
Now, that is clearly a very exaggerated story. Does the sutra mean that there really was such a light that shot, shot right up into the, the universe? I doubt it. This seems to me to be a, um, an analogy or a, uh, what's called in uh, Indian literature, uh, alankara. Alankara is a decorative um, form meant to transmit a particular idea. Um, and I think that the idea that this is trying to transmit is this, that the coming of a Buddha, not necessarily Prince Siddhartha as a baby, but the coming of a Buddha would bring a light into the world so that people would become aware of each other and perhaps for the first time come to know or at least have the opportunity to come to know each other so that there could be communication and from that perhaps empathy towards each other. So looked at from a symbolic point of view, we need not dismiss even some of the exaggerated stories in the Tipitaka as being of no value. Some of them maybe uh, have actually quite deep meanings. Then what I did was I looked at all of the uh, information that it had to say about the Buddha's travels. And this is what we know. We've known this about the Buddha for a long time. Long before the Buddha came into the world, it was the tradition of the wandering ascetics of the time to remain in one place for the three or four year, uh, months of the year during the rainy season, and then spend the other nine months of the year wandering around. Uh, they, they, the idea was that they would um, uh, be itinerant for most of their lives. So it is uh, almost certain that the Buddha followed this uh, tradition and certainly he made it a rule for his monks. So during the Vasa, mon monks are supposed to stay in one place for that period of time and then they're supposed to go off and wander for the rest of the year. So um, then I looked at, is it possible to identify all of the places that the Buddha visited? No, it isn't. The, the majority of them, we simply don't know where they are anymore. But we do know where some of them are. And with a bit of research, I've been able to find a few other ones like Alavi and um, Vyanjana and places like that. Um, so I have been able to identify them from looking at archaeological reports. And from then, I've been able to uh, um, uh, see that the, the, the Buddha went from this place to that place and measure the distances between them. And um, of course, there are some places we already know. For example, in the Maha Paranibbana Sutta, we are told that in the last year of the Buddha's life, he went from Rajagaha to Pataligamma to Vaishali, and then from there to Kushinara, where he passed away. So we, we can, uh, without any difficulties at all, we can measure that distance and we can see how far the Buddha walked. And uh, we know that... Um, after he was enlightened, he went from Uruvella, which is now Buddha Gaya. He went from Uruvella to Gaya, and then from Gaya to uh, Varanasi, and then from Varanasi to uh, Isipatana. Once again, we know where each of these places are. We can measure the distance between them. So we know how far the Buddha traveled. And we know all sorts of other things about when the Buddha traveled or what happened when he traveled. Did he wear sandals? I found no evidence of that. Did he have a stick, a walking stick? Uh, I found no evidence of that. Did he have an umbrella? It can be very hot in India in the summertime, even in the winter during the day it can be very hot. Did he have a umbrella? Well, he made it a rule that monks shouldn't have an umbrella, so um, he probably didn't have uh, an umbrella. And then I wondered, why would, what would be wrong with a monk having an umbrella? Well, in those days, umbrellas were fairly expensive uh, accoutrements, and uh, they were usually associated with upper class and quite often with royalty. Even, um, you know, even today in uh, Malaysia, the, uh, the king of Malaysia is always has somebody holding an umbrella over his head. That's an Indian tradition. Um, did he ever travel by boat? There's only one reference in the whole of the Tipitaka of monks 
traveling by boat. There's a story that says that the uh, Ananda went from Pataligama up the river to uh, Payaga, where the Ganges meets the Yamuna River. Then he went up the Yamuna River to Kosambi. Other than that, I can find no reference to monks or the Buddha going by boat. But there is one reference where he went to Payaga, and then quickly from Payaga he went to Varanasi. It's almost certain that rather than walk all that way, he probably took a boat. So once again, by looking at very small pieces of information, getting lots of them, and there are lots of them, and putting them all together, you're able to construct a picture of, for example, in this case, the Buddha's travels. Then there are probably the more important things is the Buddha as a teacher. So we know what the Buddha taught. Have we ever looked at the suttas which he was teaching and try to extract from this how he taught? Did he argue with people? Did he agree with them? Um, did he disagree with them? And if so, how, etc.? Well, we have more information about that than anything else concerning the Buddha because primarily the Buddha was a teacher. Uh -huh. So we know all sorts of things about him. I'd like to mention just one or two things, and I have included these things in my book simply because it seems to me that they never get talked about. When you read a life of the Buddha nowadays, probably, sorry, a book about the Buddha nowadays, including a life of the Buddha, you'll find that probably maybe 15 or 20 percent of the book is about the Buddha's life. He married Yasodhara and this happened and that happened and so on. Then the rest of it will be about what the Buddha taught. Well, I haven't included anything about what the Buddha taught, simply because everybody else writes about that. I've talked about how the Buddha talked, how he communicated his teaching. And this is, I can't talk about them now because this is the largest part of the book. This is the most fascinating part of the book. Anybody who is a teacher today uh, or a communicator today would be fascinated to see the skill, the subtlety, the goodwill and the politeness with which the Buddha transmitted his teachings. And probably this is a good lesson for anybody who's uh, communicating the Dhamma nowadays. If we were able to know how the Buddha taught with such a skill and such um, subtlety, then uh, we could learn a lot from that. What else can we know about the Buddha? Well, there are many um, accolades to the Buddha throughout the Tipitaka, naturally enough, uh, because it was mainly compiled by his disciples and they uh, had a great deal of regard and respect for him. But what I've done is looked at what his opponents said about him, what they accused him of, what they thought about him. So it's always important to get a third party's view of a particular person. And some of the things that the Buddha's opponents said about him are very interesting. And most interesting of all, some of the criticism of him are still being made today. <laughs> I found that fascinating. So, for example, you can, uh, some other religions, when they're talking about the Buddha, the first thing that they will say is, well, he was a, a nihilist, a nihilist. Nirvana is just nothingness. It's a, it's a big blank. The Buddha taught um, he was an annihilationist. Well, he was accused of exactly that during his lifetime, and he answered that uh, argument very, very well. Uh, another thing that uh, I've heard as a critique of Buddhism is, Okay, uh, so your goal is you attain uh, nirvana by having no desires at all. So how can you attain a state of no desires by desiring to have it? Well, that uh, seems to be a bit of a problem. Well, there are three places in the Tipitaka where two places where the Buddha answered that. He gave an answer and a very, very um, um, good answer to that question. And there's another place where Venerable Ananda, probably instructed by the Buddha, gave a, um, a very cogent and plausible answer to that uh, apparent problem. 
Um, then uh, the uh, second last um, chapter of the book, uh, I look at the problems that the Buddha had with his Sangha. So most people will know the story about Devadatta, who created lots of problems for the Buddha. And many people will know about the problem at Kosambi. There was a problem between two groups of monks ended up becoming very hostile to each other and arguments and what have you. I have looked at, um, I've looked at both of these incidents and it seems that both of them happened probably sometime within the last 10 years of the Buddha's life. And the interesting thing is if you go from the Tipitaka and look at all of the information about when people, uh, monks and nuns were rude to the Buddha, or they refused to follow his uh, instructions, or they disagreed with each other. Sometimes there are personality differences. Sometimes there are quite furious arguments about how the Dhamma is to be interpreted. It would seem that in the later years of the Buddha's life, there were the standards within the Sangha seems to have declined uh, not uh, amongst everybody, of course, but amongst many. And this is well represented by the story which you may know in the uh, Mahaparinibbana Sutta, which looks at the last year of the Buddha's life. After um, uh, some monks heard that the Buddha had passed away, they broke down and cried. They were extremely upset. But one monk, Subhadda, his name was, he said, well, why are you crying? we are well rid of the great Samana. When he was alive, he was constantly telling us, do this, don't do that. Now that he's gone, we can do what he wants. We can do what we want. And apparently there were quite a few monks who actually did think along these lines. And there were some who had been thinking along those lines before. And I found this rather interesting that just how much information there is on this subject uh, when you put it all together. And it reminded me of the, um, uh, the biography of St. Francis of Assisi, who of all of the Christian saints is probably most similar to the Buddha in many ways. He was an ascetic too. He was from a wealthy family. He renounced the world and became a simple wandering ascetic. So there's certainly some interesting uh, similarities between them. And the interesting thing about... Um, St. Francis was that his disciples were supposed to live in poverty. And before he died, they'd started to become quite wealthy because they were so popular. People admired them for their simple lifestyle that they were constantly wanting to give them things uh, out, of, out of devotion. And so some of the monks became very, very, uh, very wealthy. And uh, when uh, St. Francis um, told them that they shouldn't be living like that, they basically kicked him out of the organization. <laughs> so I found it quite interesting that not as bad as that happened to the Buddha, but something similar. He had a long and successful career, but towards the end of his life, problems started to merge, uh, emerge within the Sangha. And the last chapter of my book looks at the last 12 months of the Buddha's life. And that is one um, incident in the Buddha's life that we do have a lot of information about. The Mahaparinibbana Sutta contains a lot of information about um, that last 12, year, uh, 12 months of the Buddha's life. Now, the question is, is, is this important? None of the information that I have uh, accumulated for this book and arranged in this book is unavailable to anybody. It's, it's all from the Tipitaka. And in every case, I've given the reference so that you can look up the page number in the Tipitaka and see where it says that. Um, but the problem is, is that most people do not read the Tipitaka. There are various reasons for this. First of all, the literature is not easy to read. Uh, secondly, um, Buddhists are not really encouraged to, to do it. Uh, and thirdly, uh, the Tipitaka is a very large collection of stories. It's about 50 volumes in an English translation. However, Buddhism is coming now into the modern world. Even in Asia, it's being confronted by 
great, great challenges. First of all, just modernity and the um, disposal of the um, sort of um, modern society where, where the emphasis is on material wealth and what have you, the uh, consumer society. And of course, there are religious challenges. There are religious groups who are working very diligently to try to replace uh, Buddhism with their own faith. Um, is Buddhism prepared for these challenges? I, I don't think so, not at all. Uh, there are lights on the horizon, but uh, there's a long, long way to go. The challenge uh, is that we need to know more about the Dhamma, and with that, we need to know more about the Buddha. We need to know what the earliest Buddhists thought about the Buddha. We need to know the legends, most of us know those already too, but we need to know what is from the early tradition and therefore the most authentic tradition and what is from a later tradition. So I have been confronted by people once who brought up this subject of the um, miracle of uh, Sankasya. You mean to tell me that the Buddha came down from the heaven on a great uh, escalator? So one minute you're telling me that Buddhism is scientific and the next you're telling me a great big escalator, golden escalator came down from the heaven and the Buddha came. That's not very scientific. And then I say, yeah, no, it's not. I quite agree. But the Buddha didn't teach that and it didn't happen to them. It didn't happen to him. Because I know the difference between what's in the scriptures and what has been evolved and developed and grown in centuries later, I can answer that challenge. And my hope is that those who uh, read the book when it comes out will, first of all, they will learn more about the Buddha. And I'm sure that this will give them a renewed devotion and respect for this man. Secondly, it portrays him as a real person, not somebody sort of half between myth and reality, a real person living in time and space at a particular place. The Buddha was as real a person as... Julius Caesar or Jesus Christ or the prophet Muhammad or, or Plato. He was as real as these people were, and there is sufficient evidence and information to show that that is true. The third thing is that it depicts the Buddha as an accessible person. Um, his his uh, wisdom was far beyond our own. But that does not mean that he was not accessible. He was very accessible because... That's He wanted to be accessible so that he could communicate his Dhamma. And it is through his teachings that we get to know him and we are able to understand the Dhamma in human terms. So I think that it is really very important to know more about uh, the Dhamma. All of us should be giving ourselves to that. And uh, also, uh, I hope people will get to know, become more familiar with the Buddha uh, as a result of uh, the research I've done on this uh, in this book. Okay, that's that's about all I have to say. Uh, yeah, that's about nearly an hour. Uh, so, um, uh, what I'd like to do now, or what we're going to do now, is uh, have a question and answer period. But um, and I'm very happy to answer any questions you have. But what I think would be a good idea is what. Uh, that Victor said uh, some time ago is, first of all, if there are any questions you've got about what I've said to, tonight, and then when we exhaust that, if there's any time left, we'll, and if you like, we'll uh, talk about any other questions you might like to ask. Yes, thank you very much, Vera Dameka. And I think there are some questions that have actually come in, but there Already? are some which, wow. are, which are more like uh, more like comments. I think okay. the latest that I have, there are 235 people uh, listening mm. to your talk. Oh, which wonderful! Is a, which is a nice number. But then the, we will lay further more uh, further further uh, later on explore really how many people there are. But what Venerable has mentioned is that you know he is, uh, you know, he's actually talking about the book uh, that is uh, that is ready now to be published. And uh, the understanding that we have about the Buddha, um, you know, is a mixture of what has been found in the Tripitaka. But the Tripitaka itself does not really contain that much information of the Buddha as the, uh, you know, uh, with all these miracles and all that, not much of his life, but more as him as a teacher and more of his teachings. And so if you want to try to understand the Buddha, 
uh, as a living person, living in space and time, very accessible teacher who tries to communicate the Dharma of people, then you can actually get that from the, uh, the Pali Tripitaka. That is the image that you get of, of the Buddha. But again, over time, um, the story of the Buddha has been expanded, uh, maybe in the, even in the Sanskrit tradition. Uh, many of these stories have been come out later. Of course, it beautifies the Buddha. They are, know. they are really Symbolism, lovely, most beautiful, of them. and it inspires the mind, it inspires the imagination. And these are the kind of stories that we have grown up with. And even now, uh, uh, you know, there are new stories about the Buddha. And, uh, you know, they isn't are that fascinating? Others. Yeah, you know, it's only that people do get impressed with the Buddha, and new stories have emerged about the Buddha. So, this actually is, is very interesting. Um, the uh, so uh, now let us look at the first uh, question. Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, oh, according to the Facebook, there are three hundred and eleven people now. According to Facebook Live, first question is that um, I'm not really quite clear about this question. This is by Brother Leong Yu Ming. He says that the Buddha's father was a chieftain of the second clan. He was a chieftain, but uh, he's often been referred to as a king. And uh, is this uh, an attempt to glorify the Buddha because the Buddha was considered to be a bodhisattva? Please clarify, Bhante. Okay. Yeah, well, uh, no. Uh, th basically, this is what happened is the word Raja um, uh, originally meant a chief. And in, the, in India at that time, in northern India, uh, what happened was you originally you had a form of government which sometimes is called republican. Uh, that's a little bit modern, but, but more like the Greek city states, where uh, the men of the uh, of the uh, of the chiefdom or the senior men of the chiefdom would elect from amongst themselves one person, and sometimes he would be leader for the whole of his life, or more likely he would be leader for a given period of time, five years or ten years, something like that, or he would be chief for as long as he had their confidence. When they didn't weren't confident in him anymore or he made too many mistakes, they would uh, uh, vote against him and they'd vote in somebody else. It was something like that. Okay, so at the time of the Buddha, society was changing a lot. It was a time of great change. And what was happening, many chiefs were turning into kings. Okay, I got voted in, now I'm not going to leave. <laughs> and so you had two forms of government at the time of the Buddha. You had these uh, uh, chiefdoms, which were sort of republics with a, a degree of uh, citizen participation. And you had kings, kings like uh, Pasenadi was a king. Uh, Pasenadi of um, Kosala was a king. Um, Bimbisara of uh, Magadha was a king. But you had those other forms of government too. So the word Raja was starting to take on a different meaning. Originally it meant uh, a chieftain at the time of the Buddha it uh, so there are two places where the Buddha's father is referred to as a Raja but in another sutta in the um, Ambatta Sutta it specifically mentions that the Sakyans had a group of people called Raja Katas meaning king makers what were the king makers the king makers were almost certainly older senior men of the Sakyan uh, lands who elected their Raja. So the word, and as the republics gradually disappeared and, and the whole political system became monarchies, then the word Raja was used specifically for kings. But it had this double meaning at the time of the... Um, at the time of the Buddha. Why did uh, later generations consider the uh, uh, Buddha's father to be a king? As you said, maybe to glorify him. I don't know. Yes, actually, this is an interesting, Bhante, because even in Malaysia itself, we have those who are um, you know, based on their lineage, they become kings and their children, then you will That's have right, something yeah. like a crown prince, and a raja, right, yeah. and so on. But in the case of Nagri Sambilan, they would have uh, chieftains and amongst themselves, uh, you know, they will they will elect 
who will become the young Dipatua, who is going to be the head. Yes, uh, so you have that in the yeah. Grisa Bilan. And that sounds to me like what the Sakyans are practicing. Yes. They, that, yeah. The Malas, the Sakyans, uh, hmm. and, and, and the Lichi. How about the Vajians? Yeah, well, the, the Vajians, they, yes. they, they were all basically what we would call republics, as long as you don't think it's sort of like a, it was mainly, probably not even all men. Men landed who, uh, men who had a lot of wealth, landed property, a lot of cows, mm. perhaps they'd been in battles when they were young men, now they're grey beards, and they were the people who voted mm. for, the, for the Raja. So maybe uh, for those who have always thought that, uh, you know, the Sudodana was a king in the manner of King Bimbisara. Not in the sense Kinswane, that we understand. We need a little bit of adjustments. Uh, this yeah. is based on historical research. Uh, yeah. The Sakins were not organized exactly in that manner. Yeah. So, uh, so that's interesting. Now we have a comment. This is from uh, Brother David T. And he says, yes, uh, since the appearance of the Buddha more than 2,500 years ago, millions have found a way to end suffering and pain, attaining everlasting peace and happiness. This indeed is remarkable in the history of the world. So let us not waste this precious human life and the ultimate truth in the Buddha's Dharma and leading to the end of uh, Dukkha and Sangsara and attain Nibbana. Uh, right. So this is just a comment. Uh, mm -hmm. Question from... Brother Adrian Bay, uh, hi Bante, he says, <laughs> do we risk mm -hmm. uh, secularizing the sutras if we, do, if we believe that the devas mentioned are not gods and deities? And wouldn't this have a big implication considering that there are many sutras uh, which mentioned, uh, of, uh, we've mentioned of devas? Uh, you know, so this is in conjunction with your, uh, when you were mentioning about uh, right. the Mangala Sutta, uh, you know, uh, and uh, the Buddha was supposed to have taught the Mangala Sutta to Devas. Uh, how do we take the Devas here? You know, because okay. there are many references of the, uh, of yes, the Devas yes, yes. in the yep. Tripitaka. Yep, right. Okay, so I, I think the word secularize is not quite correct here. I would probably use the word demythologize, okay? However, you make an interesting point. So this is what I say, is that can you think of an essential Buddhist doctrine that depends upon a god? Because I don't know any. So the gods seem to be decorations. They seem to be um, like uh, the secondary or third, third level character in a play. The, 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 the hero of the play is the Buddha. Occasionally, gods come into the story in order to glorify the Buddha or to make a point that the Buddha has already made. That seems to me to be the role of the gods in the in the Tipitaka. Um, now, I, I thought very deeply about this, um, and um, I would certainly recommend you to read uh, Sujatu and Brahmali's absolutely fantastic book called The Authenticity of the Early Buddhist Texts. It's published by the Buddhist Publication Society. It is an absolutely outstanding book. I think it's one of the best books written on Buddhism in the last 15 years. I really do. It's a very, very good book. And he goes into this subject. Why are the gods running, uh, appearing and disappearing in the Tipitaka all of the time? And uh, Sujato says, and I, I agree with him, they are sort of to decorate it, to make the story interesting. And they are taking into account the fact that most people at that time did believe in devas. So they couldn't be just dismissed. So they were used as props for the Buddha's Dhamma. They were props. You know what I mean? You know what a prop is? Yeah, yeah, of course. What, what's a prop? The, as a support. <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a secondary support. Secondary support. That's, I would say. Uh, so I don't think we... Um, now, if somebody wants to believe in Davis, it's quite okay. But don't give them an importance that they simply don't have. Myself, I'm in two minds about it. If you, uh, if you think that gods, they've got these jewels on their heads and they've got these lovely and they've got these like these Burmese things on their shoulders, and, uh, sorry, I, I, I have to part company with you. But as for sort of um, wispy spirits, I think it's possible that such things exist, yes.
Okay. Are they important? Not particularly. I can't say I'm going to spend a lot of time thinking about whether they do exist or don't, because to me, they're not really important. You could take the, 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 uh, all the suttas and remove the gods from them, and the suttas would remain just as valid and just as useful as they were before. That's my feeling. Okay, so that is as far as the, uh, the whether, uh, you know, how do we uh, take the issue of uh, devas? There's a question here. Uh, it's about um, the uh, nuns' uh, order. Why was the Buddha so reluctant to ordain his aunt and her companions uh, when they asked, uh, you know, to be ordained as bhikkhunis? Yeah. Mm, I've given some thought to that. In fact, I didn't, uh, I only mentioned this incident very briefly because it has been very widely covered in the last few years because of, you know, women wanting to know about this. I think probably the reason was, and there, if you look at other rules pertaining to nuns, I think we can work out what was going on. Um, India is a pretty rough place, and it always has been. A woman walking around by herself has to be very careful, even today. And a woman who is fancy free uh, in much of traditional Asia, even in the Middle East and that, she want to be very, very careful. Okay, A, a woman by herself was easy game. So that, I think, was the first reason. And that probably is the reason why one of the uh, rules in the Vinaya is that ma uh, nuns must live in a monastery in the town, in the city. And I think the reason for that is to make sure that they would be safe. The second reason, I think, pertains to sexuality. Okay, you've got an organization that's mainly men, or you've got an organization that's mainly women. You probably don't have too many problems. Have an organization where there are men and women together, and chances are they're going to be, uh, there might be problems. Uh, and uh, I mean, it's in the newspaper every day, in the office, in, 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 in the sports field, in virtually everywhere. Now, this doesn't mean that women are the problem, and it doesn't mean that men are the problem. It means that the two together, you've got to be really very careful. And I think that that was the reason why. That's my personal feeling. Mm. Okay. And incidentally, this is still a problem, like I said, every day in the newspaper. Politicians, virtually in every situation where men and women are, are together. And it's a very sad situation. I don't think the solution should be to keep them apart, as is done in some cultures, but maybe that's the reason why those, uh, those customs and rules did develop in the first place. Mm. Mm. Okay. So yeah. there, are, there are certain uh, reasons. Uh, some of them could be social reasons, but even right up to now, we have the issue. Uh, yeah, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, all the no, time. we've always yeah. had this issue. It's just yeah. now that it's coming out, and that right, you know, right, it will never go away. <laughs> yeah, you know, well, I hope it will. No, no, I, I hope it will. But uh, got my fingers crossed. Uh. <laughs> there is a question uh, about the Buddhist mother. Uh, why must the Buddhist mother pass away after giving birth to the uh, to the to the baby to the to the bodhisattva? Uh, what are the cause? Uh, what are the causes for the mother to die? Uh, this okay. is. Well, if you look at uh, infant mortality in, in the UK in 1900, about 15% of women died in childbirth. That was in the most developed country in the world. Okay, If you look at um, uh, further back, when you had childbirth fever and these sorts of things, where some, up to 50% of women, particularly in hospitals, usually a woman who gave birth at home had a better chance. There are various reasons for that. But um, it was very, very common throughout the world and in countries like undeveloped countries like in Africa, it still is. Childbirth is a time of great anxiety and danger. Okay. Fortunately, we live in cultures where we have sterile hospitals. We've got the best maternal care before the uh, the child is born, during the birth birthing process, and in the weeks afterwards, they didn't have that in those days. I suspect that the Buddha's mother just um, probably got childbirth fever or perhaps uh, excessive bleeding and just uh, died. Okay, um, uh, that reminds me of another issue. Uh, if I can say this, um, I looked at the Buddha's son Rahula, and this 
raised a question for me, which I have never seen raised before. Okay, we don't know what the Buddha's wife's name was, and we don't know when he was married. But we do know, because I looked at the ancient Dhammashastras, these are the law books from ancient India. And in most country, in most uh, cultures, um, in most law books, it says that when a girl has her first period, and when a boy is 14, they are married. And the reason why they're married early was because the chances of living to adulthood were not good. <laughs> That's the reason why. So it's very likely that the Buddha was married when he was 14, 15 or 16, almost certain. How old his wife was, I, I don't know. But then he renounced the world when he was 29. How come they only had one child? From 14 to 29, one child? What's going on here? So I looked at the law books again. So the first thing you could think of is, well, perhaps she was um, uh, barren or perhaps he was sterile. That's possible. In other words, they were having sexual relations, but either one of them or the other, or maybe both of them, they weren't fertile. That's possible. However, when you look at the law books, it says very clearly, if a woman hasn't um, given birth to a son within three years, she's out. Now, it's quite possible that uh, Gautama, before he was the Buddha, perhaps he loved his wife and he would want to keep her even though she couldn't give birth to a child. But social pressure would have forced them out. It was absolutely essential to have children and particularly a son. And according to the ancient law books, if a wife hasn't produced a son within just two or three years, she is to be divorced. So that doesn't seem to be likely. It's certainly unlikely that they didn't have more than one child. So there's another possibility. Maybe they did have more children. And the only reason we know about um, uh, Rahula was because he became a monk. So that's a possibility. Maybe there were other children. But, but I dismissed that idea too, because the Buddha went to return to Kapalavastu quite a few times. And while he was there, he talked to his father, he talked to his uh, stepmother, he talked to his uncle, and he talked to another uncle, Mahanama, frequently. If he'd have had siblings, uh, brothers and sisters, undoubtedly there would have been some discourses between him and them. There aren't any. Okay, so it would seem that there weren't any, uh, he didn't have any siblings. So the other, other possibility then is that they did have a few children, but they all died in infancy or at birth or in their early teens. And I think that that is quite possible. But Bhante, when you presented it, uh, when you present it that way, but the, how do we make sense of the story that when the Buddha returned to the kingdom of Kapilavastu, uh, you know, he was telling the monks, you know, uh, you know, there was this, this uh, Yashodara that would be approaching him, please uh, don't do anything. And after she had paid respect to him, uh, she actually told Rahula, you know, see the men over there, go and ask for your inheritance. Mm -hmm. And Rahula went to the Buddha and says, oh, uh, monk, even your shadow is pleasing to me. And then as far as the inheritance goes, get the boy ordained. So how, how do we make sense of that? And also when, Yashod when Yashodora, I believe that she was also with, uh, uh, with the, um, uh, you know, with the auntie, uh, walking down all the way to Vaishali uh, to be ordained as nuns. That is what we understand. And also uh, Yashodara passed away before the Buddha. She, she paid respect to the Buddha and uh, before she passed away. So this is the kind of stories that we have, uh, that we understand of Yashodara. Yeah. So, so these stories, you, there's no mention of you, the, the name Yashodara does not occur anywhere in the Tipitaka. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't mean that there wasn't such a woman, but I'm just saying in the, when, when the, uh, the Arahats put all the Tipitaka together, they didn't include anything about a wife. Mm. Okay. The only reason we know that he was married is because uh, somebody called Rahula Mata, Rahula's mother, is mentioned two times very briefly, virtually mm. nothing. So, so what her real name was, we, we simply don't know. Okay.
Mm. So you, all the other stories about um, Ayyasodhara, uh, they're from much, much later. I was also, and of course, and and of course, you, you probably know. Sorry to interrupt you. You probably know in other later works. I'm not sure about the Mahavastu, but in the Lalita Vistara, she's not called Yasodhara. She's called Gopi. Mm -hmm. And in some other later works, she's Bambi. given another name. Yeah. yeah. So um, I'm just looking at what's in the Tipitaka, and in the Tipitaka, um, she gets. Two, two very brief re references, both of them related to the story that you just told about uh, ask your father for his inheritance. I'm not sure whether it is, was it because of the, in terms of the, uh, the in the Pali sources, they, they were not very good in capturing some of the, the, these details, because some of the stories of the Buddha come from the Savasti Vardins. Uh, which mm -hmm. is, of course, also an early form of Buddhism. You know, it seems to have come from that tradition. Yeah, well, um, um, what was I going to say? Oh, sorry, something occurred to me while you were just talking, and I, I can't remember what it was now. Um, oh, that's right. This is what I was going to say. Who compiled the Tipitaka? They were monks. What were they interested in? They were interested in the Buddha and his Dhamma. They were not, they had no interest whatsoever in what the Buddha did until he became a wandering ascetic. That's as simple as it. Mm. Whether he was married or not married, whether they had a fan in the, or an aircon in their room, he was mm. simply not interested, and yeah. that's that's the reason why it. it they were they, they had a particular uh, what's the word um, uh, agenda, and the agenda was to preserve the dhamma. It was only later on that people asked more questions. Who was this guy? Well, was he married? Did he have brothers and sisters? And it's only later. And that's when the, what you might call the myth-making machine got going. And they did it with great brilliance. I mean, some, I mean, my favorite story, I really wished, I've always wished that this story was in the Tipitaka, and it isn't. Mm -hmm. And that's the story about Prince Siddhartha and the goose, or Prince Siddhartha and the swan. I think this is one of the most beautiful, meaningful, and charming stories. Unfortunately, <laughs> mm. it's not in the. It's not even in the Pali commentaries. It's from a later Mahayana Sutra. Yeah, I could understand that because uh, we were following the uh, stories about Xuan Zhang. So if you look at the tongue, the great tongue record of Xuan Zhang, it is just a description of the various kingdoms that he visited. 130 kingdoms, you know, what was the economy like, who was the kings like, how many monasteries there were. There was not much information about him at all. He was mm. just recording the facts. Yeah, and the yeah. thing that we understand about Sun Zhang was actually the biography that was written by his disciple Hui Li. So if you don't have a Hui Li, Sun Zhang, and if you read the great tongue records, Sun Zhang would actually disappear. <laughs> So yeah. maybe the, the Pali scriptures is like that. They were more interested yeah. in the teachings of the Buddha rather yeah. than the, in the story about the Buddha himself. Well, e e even if you go back later, really until about the 18th century, biography was not a genre in, in Sanskrit literature. So you've got things like the Rama Charita would be one. Another one would be the Harsha Charita about King Harsha. And these are supposed to be biographies. They're not really biographies. They're... So biography, stories of lives or autobiographies, uh, until the 19th century, they simply were not a part of, uh, there was no genre of, of, of those two types of genre in, so it's not surprising that the monks who compiled the Tipitaka were not interested in the Buddha's life until he became a monk. Hmm. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, there are, there are a few other questions. Yeah, go on, hit, hit me with <laughs> it. It says, uh, this is from Ajita Lim, and he says, Dear Venerable Damika, thank you for your insightful teaching, but how do we reconcile the need to be scientific in our approach to the teaching uh, to a, more, a Buddhism to a modern audience without sacrificing the inspiring aspects of the Buddha's life? Well, no problem, you can still use those as long as you know the difference between them. So if I was setting up a Sunday school, for example, I'd probably include the story about the four sites and the wonderful one about the wood because they're absolutely beautiful. But as somebody grew older and was more mature, then I would introduce them to um, uh, um, uh, the, the earlier, most basic and authentic teachings. Hmm. 
Okay. So a, an example of this would be, um, um, well, here we go back to St. Francis. You know, in, in most Christian countries at Christian time, uh, Christmas time, people get a, a little manger and they've got little toy a, a sheep and a, a cow and what have you and the little baby Jesus in the... It was St. Francis who did that first and that tradition has remained in Christianity ever since then. We used to do it at home and as young kids we absolutely loved it. Now, that story is not in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what it is it's two stories put together so in in one version it's three wise men in another version it's the shepherds so in this little um, uh, manger that you make you've popped the two stories together so it's really not not the real story but does that matter no as something that can enliven young people and and uh, give itself beautifully to art and what have you fantastic but I think that today's Buddhists, given the challenges that Buddhism faces, we've got to know our tradition well and know what is from the Tibetica and what isn't from the Tibetica. That's what I would say. Mm. Okay. Uh, there is a question from uh, Lil Chio. Uh, she says that, Bante, how do you reconcile uh, the 28 Buddhas? and uh you know uh scientifically because it doesn't seem to fit into the age of the earth yep. itself yeah yep. but i think the 28 buddhas refers to also buddhas in the other world systems <laughs> well uh, it's the 28 buddhas of course is a very late creation i'm sorry to tell you so the buddha himself mentioned i think uh, five previous buddhas okay but i uh look i'm not quite sure about this but um this is how I understand the previous Buddhas. All of the uh, ascetic traditions at the time of the Buddha looked back to great teachers of the past. So, for example, we know that the Jains looked back to a great teacher who lived about 200 years earlier. So Mahavira, the founder of Jainism, he, he didn't actually start a religion. He reformed and he reformed and reformulated the teachings of an earlier teacher. So all of these traditions had an idea that they weren't doing anything new, that they were uh, revitalizing something that had been taught by a great teacher of the past. So the Jains had their great teachers of the past. The Buddha believed himself to be a part of a lineage of other great teachers, okay? And it is very likely that there were other such teachers. Now, by that, I don't mean that they taught the Four Noble Truths and etc., because they had been mythologized. But still, the Buddha very clearly believed that he was the most recent of a long chain of great teachers. But he only mentioned five of them. I think it's either five or six. But once again, typically in, in the Buddhist tradition, somebody added, oh, how about a seventh one? I think <laughs> we need eight. And, and we ended up having 20, what is it, 26 of them? 28. <laughs> 28, okay. Yeah, well, now, I, I'm not sure whether the Buddha actually mentions how long ago these teachers lived. But if, we, if, if it's 100,000 light years or whatever it is, I, I mean, this cannot be taken seriously. But that there were other great teachers of the past partly true, partly mythologized, uh, almost lost in the past, but still partly remembered. Yes, I think that's they certainly were. Mm. We have a question from a monk, oh, uh, good. Bhikkhu Dhammarama, oh, and he was saying, how many sutras have you found in the Tripitaka related to the life of the Buddha, if you could name them? I think they're also found in your book, actually. <laughs> Well, if you mean on the life of the Buddha, the, yes, in the Pritak, Pritak, well, okay, the Acharya, the Acharya Buddha Dhamma Sutta, which is in the Majjhima Nikaya, that that purports to be the events that took place during the Buddha's life, but it is very uh, mythologized and is probably somewhat later. Probably the most important one would be the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, 
which is the largest sutta in the Tipitika, and that's in the Diga Nikaya. And then in some other suttas, like the uh, Mahasiyanada Sutta, I think it is, in the Maji there are two suttas in the Mahasiyan uh, in the Majjhima Nikaya where the Buddha talks about the austerities that he practiced before he was enlightened. But it's certainly not uh, other than that. It, it's only that those events in his life. So there are a few of them, but not very many. And then, for example, the Padana Sutta, which is the only Sutta. I mean, there are three or four versions of the Buddha's enlightenment. But there's only one that mentions his attack being attacked by Mara. And that is in the uh, Padana Sutta, in the, uh, in the Sutta Nipata, for example. So uh, there are some suttas where the Buddha reminisces about some things that he did in the past. But as for one sutta that deals with a, 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 a long span of the Buddha's life, there are none. The, only, the biggest one is the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, which talks about an event that took place in a period of a year, roughly a year. Um, if if you would like to get something like that, you could read Jnana Moli's The Life of the Buddha, where he uh, includes every sutta and every extract from a sutta where the Buddha is talking about his life. Mm. Like I said, the Buddha says virtually nothing about his life until he became a wandering ascetic at the age of 29. Okay, there is a question yeah. from uh, Brother Tanwa Chai. He says that uh, this is a command. Unlike the Christians who make the effort to know about Jesus Christ, the Buddhists pay less attention to the life of the Buddha, at least to seek inspiration. And this is joined by uh, Kuni Wen, who says that the Kosambi incident is one example of how the Buddha dealt with conflict and internal politics. Um, well, uh, it depends on how you read that story, because there are three versions of the story, and they, in broad outline, they're basically the same, but in details, they're quite different. So, for example, uh, one version of the story is that the Buddha was so disgusted with these monks, he left and he went to the Parileya forest, where he was looked after by an elephant. But another version of the story says that he went to Sravasti. But the most interesting thing about the uh, Kosambi incident is in the Tipitika, we never find out what happened. We find out that there was a conflict. We don't know what caused the conflict. We find out that the, the, the Buddha tried to bring about a reconciliation. So in one version, yes, there was a reconciliation. Another version, there wasn't a reconciliation. One version says that uh, both versions say that the Buddha was disgusted and he left Kosambi, but the different versions say that he went to different places. Okay, But most important at all, or most frustrating for all, is whether the, uh, the conflict was ever resolved, we don't know, it doesn't say. So here would be the role of the myth maker to fill in the gaps and to present a whole. But the story as a whole does not exist in the Tipitika. We only get fragments of it, and it's quite hard to reconcile some of them. Okay. Incidentally, it's the same with the uh, Devadatta story too. There's less confusion there. There's less um, contradictions there, but the, the story is not quite clear either. So, for example, in the um, Devadatta Sutta, we, we, we don't ever find out what happened to Devadatta. Yeah. Next. <laughs> Bhante, you're almost running out of time now. Right. Uh, okay. Let me just run through the whole series of questions and you just pick up what okay, you I'll, wish to respond. Give me three or four and I'll answer them as quickly as I can. Okay. One was that was a Buddha vegetarian. No. Uh, next, next, next no. And, and, uh, oh, I, hold on. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. There is only one place in the Tipitaka where the Buddha refused to eat a particular type of food. Hmm. And that was... It's, it is, the story is mentioned in the Sutta Nipata. A Brahmin had just performed a sacrifice. And at these sacrifice, not animals were not always uh, sacrificed. At the, some sacrifices were grain or milk or curd was offered to the sacred fire, not always animals. Uh, however, there were sacrificial cakes. 
and those cakes were offered and mantras were chanted over them and then they were ceremoniously offered to the gods and then the participants in the ritual would then eat them so this brahman had a whole lot of these cakes and he was looking for somewhere somebody to give them to and he saw the buddha and he said would you like them and the buddha flatly refused to eat them that is the only and he said not only will i eat them no enlightened person would eat them that's the only incident in the whole of the Tipitaka where the Buddha refused to eat a particular type of food and he ate meat, meat when it was offered to him. Next question. Okay, there are some follow-up questions from Adrian Bray Bay who asked you about the, the devas. He says that uh, he does agree that uh, the gods uh, or devas do not play a central role in the Dhamma, but uh, would we extend this to the psychic ability of being able to into no uh, uh, the good because, because it's linked up with uh, uh because in the ratana sutta and the atantiya suttas they were also mentioned about you know yeah, yeah, there's no doubt yeah oh uh, yeah no mm. no I'll, I'll deal with the thing about the psychic powers so i i think that the buddha definitely had some sort of psychic abilities but i also think that some people probably believed that the Buddha had certain psych abilities that he didn't have. Now, now, very briefly, this is what happened. The Buddha was a charismatic person. He had, he had this charismatic power. Um, there were various reasons for it. And we know from studies of psychology that people who have charismatic uh, abilities people tend to believe that they have powers that they don't really have, that they don't even claim to have. So uh, an example of this would be Michael Jackson. Oh, isn't he fantastic? So all sorts of stories about him. Another one would be, you may remember the very charismatic monk, uh, Thai monk, Achan Yantra, many years ago. Now, uh, he had a, a very attractive personality. He had a, a great following. And people believe that he had all sorts of these amazing powers, which he did not have. So it is quite possible that many of the psychic abilities that the Buddha was attributed to having, he actually didn't have. But I do believe that the Buddha had, did have certain psychic abilities. Abilities. I think he was able sometimes to read other people's minds and perhaps some other things like that. But as for flying and what have you, count me out. I, I, I can't accept that. But, you know, if you want to believe that, that's quite okay. But I, I don't. But I do think that the Buddha did have psychic abilities. Yeah, next question. There is a question about, you know, uh, in the first Buddhist council, wasn't the mystical part of the discourses weeded out because this first council was attended by Arahans. Uh, he, this was also in reference to the Mangala Sutta, because Mangala Sutta was supposed to be preached to the devas. Well, it doesn't say that. Uh, oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, well, this this is this is an interesting question. I uh, we really, I mean, it is certainly not the case that the Tapitika as we have it today is identical word for word verbatim of what was recited at the. First Council. That simply cannot be, it's easy to disprove that. The core material certainly reflects a, a very accurate account of what the Buddha said. But if you think that they all sat down and they chanted the Tipitaka exactly as it is today, well, that's a little bit too simplistic. Okay. But this is certainly is the case. I didn't deal with this in my book, but it is very apparent throughout the Tipitaka that there was tensions between Ananda and Kasapa. If you put all of their meetings together, you can see they didn't get along very well together. And when Kasapa was asked um, uh, to select the monks who were to participate in the first council, he pointedly didn't mention Ananda. It was only when the other monks said, hey, what about Ananda? You know, he spent 20 years right beside the Buddha. Mm. Okay, then. Mm. So there was, now I happen to think that uh, one of the reasons why there is so much emphasis upon living in the forest, living a hard ascetic life, that was due to the influence of Mahakasapa. And the suttas dealing with lay uh, 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 ethics and uh, uh, how to deal with your money, your financial management and all of that, of which there is tons in the Tibitika, I think that's due to Ananda. 
And I think that if uh, Ananda hadn't been there, there probably wouldn't be any mention of women whatsoever. So I think that it probably worked out very well that these two people uh, who were the main uh, instigators of the, uh, they were sort of, they had a harmonic um, a tension between them. This one kept this one from getting too much out of hand. This one kept this one from getting too much out of hand. <laughs> okay. Maybe, yes. maybe one more question. And then, then I have one more question. Uh, from somebody who hasn't asked a question before. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is uh, that... Uh, there's a question about in some sutras, there was a reference that when the Bodhisattva was young, he was seated under the rose okay. apple tree yep. and the meditation that played a role in the, his technique. So he was going back yep. to Anapanasati. So later on, when he sat under the Bodhi tree, he recalled the incident of That's sitting right. under yes. there. He, uh, and uh, this, uh, he would like to find out what is your take on this one. Okay. That story is mentioned in the Tibetica and it is mentioned by the Buddha himself. First thing is, what was what was uh, the Bodhisattva watching or doing while he was sitting under that tree? It's supposed to be watching his breath, right? Anapanasati. No, it doesn't mention. I haven't heard that. What I always see, and I see pictures of it, that his father was plowing. Hmm. Okay. Now this is interesting. It's going to take a few minutes, but I hope I can manage this. So in every account that I've read, except in the Tibetica, it mentions that his father was plowing and that he was doing the first ceremonial plowing of the year. Kings used to do that. For example, even the king of Thailand, once a year in that great big parade ground in front of the royal palace, they have a great big ceremony where he does some plowing. The first ceremony, the president of Sri Lanka used to do this. Okay. So when you read the sutta, it simply says, my father was working. So why did they change working into ceremonial plowing? Because they thought that the Buddha was a king. Sorry, they thought that Suddhodana was a king. Kings don't pull out the weeds. They don't milk the cow. They don't cut the, cut the rice. They do this ceremonial plowing. Okay. So in later centuries, work by Suddhodana was trans, trans, uh, transposed into ceremonial plowing. That's the first thing. The sutta does not mention that the Buddha was, sorry, uh, Siddhartha was... Uh, doing watching his breath it simply says that he spontaneously fell into a jhanic state and it mentions the jhanas okay so that's all that it says it says he was sitting under a tree watching his father working and spontaneously he fell into a jhanic state and i think that this would be an example of things that have happened to many people significant people in their life quite spontaneously they have sometimes called the oceanic feeling they just for no reason at all seem to have this amazing feeling and it quite often influences the rest of their lives i think that that happened to the young man uh, gotama and as you very correctly said in later life when he after he was disappointed with his um, austerities and that he remembered that event and he tried to reduplicate that experience within himself and that led to his enlightenment okay bante so we have actually oh, or we have run out of time because uh, in thank the, goodness for that i uh, want to get uh, to bed yeah i know it must be about <laughs> 11 11 40 you know <laughs> in, in, oh my in God. australia the, the, thing, so, the things i do for you goodness me <laughs> there are questions coming in also so you know that at least people are very interested in in what you're saying something new so i must encourage everybody that when this book is out footprints in the dust the life of the Buddha from the most ancient sources. Certainly, it is. It gives us the new way of looking at the stories of the Buddha. And I all hope that. so. It's yes. very useful for us to really understand. At least going back to the Pali scriptures, because uh, I guess many of the lessons are really from the Theravada tradition that goes back to the Pali. Let's go back to the Pali tradition to find out what is actually contained in the Pali text about the life of the story of the Buddha. So that becomes a very important contribution for for our understanding and knowledge. All right. So I must actually, um, on behalf of everybody, thank 
uh, Venerable uh, Dharmika for giving us such a wonderful talk today. And we are almost on the, uh, you know, coming to uh, a fortnight to uh, Wesak. So this is this is really part of our Wesak uh, uh, program. Uh, okay. Yes, and celebration. Can we, uh, uh, in closing, ask Venerable Dharmika to, ha to, to, uh, to help to, to conduct the sharing of merits for all of us? Okay, right. Uh, but we have, um, I've had the uh, pleasure of uh, sharing some uh, Dhamma knowledge with you. You've had the opportunity to hear something that uh, may clarify some issues for you or give you something to think about. In both those cases, that's a wonderful opportunity. Um, also, I, I've enjoyed so much listening to your questions, and I'm very grateful for those all of them were intelligent and thoughtful questions. Um, and it is also wonderful that despite the fact that we're all over the place, I, I'm hundreds, maybe thousands of kilometers from you, and yet we're able to communicate like this together. It's, that is a miracle. That really is a miracle. And it's a wonderful miracle. It's a way that we can share and participate in each, each other's Dhamma practice. So let us uh, dedicate the merit that we have made from this uh, to all beings everywhere. Okay. Itavacharam mihi sangpadang punya sangpadang. Sambi deva ranu mudantu samba sambanti sindia etavata charami sampadang punya sampadang sambi buta ranu mudantu samba sambanti sindia Etavata charam mihi sampadang punya sampadang Sambe Santaranu Modantu Samba Sambanti Sindia Sadu 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 Well, I think we must actually express our gratitude to Venerable Dhammika for giving us this excellent talk. And thank you, everybody, coming up for, I'm not sure how many countries this time, but we have over 300 over people listening to this talk. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for joining into this talk. I hope we have gained something from this talk. And uh, please have a wonderful um, uh, Wesak, but uh, keep safe especially during the time of pandemic. Right. Uh, thank you also. very much. And thank you all of you for your questions and your attentiveness. This is sad.